Hello everyone, welcome from Lebanon and all the region to uh, our webinar. The idea to create the European Society of Human, Embryo uh, Human Reproduction and Embryology was first conceived in Helsinki by Professor Edwards and Dr. Cohen. And since 1985, it's the first time that ISHRI uh, was held as a virtual meeting. And the hashtag was safe learning with ISHRI. But let's always stay positive and see the advantages of virtual webinars or meetings. Now all the registered participants are able to see and watch again the presentations till end of this year. For all the doctors who couldn't register or couldn't attend ISHRI, the Lebanese Fertility Society had organized three webinars uh, titled ISHRI Highlights. The first one is today, and also you can save the date for the second one and the third one on 22 and 29 of July. Let's start our first webinar with Dr. George Abitaya. Dr. Abitaya is an associate professor at the St. Joseph University. He is the head of unit of obstetrics and gynecology at Hotel Dieu de France. He is the current president of Lebanese Fertility Society. Dr. Abitaya, the floor is yours. Thank you, Elizabeth, for your uh, kind presentation. So uh, today uh, we'll begin our first webinar uh, about Ishri Highlights, the keynote lecture. This year in 2020, the keynote lecture was about association of telate, of phenols, and uh, parabens found in personal care products with pubertal timing in girls and boys. The Human Reproduction Editorial Team for the journal chose this article for the keynote lecture this year because it's the most seen paper during 2019. More than 1,300 views. This study was done to emphasize on the importance of many chemicals we use routinely in our life and how they can affect our lives and the life of our offspring. What was the study question of this paper? Are in utero or peripubertal exposure to phthalate, parabens, or phenols can be associated with the timing of pubertal onset? for the boys and for the girls. What are the environmental factors that can affect pubertal onset? We know that BMI in childhood, dietary factors, and this, in this paper, we'll talk about endocrine disrupting chemicals. We know that certain chemicals altered pubertal timing in animal studies. We know also that exogenous chemicals that block or mimic or interfere with natural hormones in our bodies can alter the endocrine system in human. The problem for the use of personal care products. The average woman uses is 12 personal care products a day in the states and for the teenage girls it's 17 personal care products a day there are more than 12,500 chemicals used in cosmetics and personal care products three principal chemicals are incriminated in hormonal alteration phthalate parabens and phenols they can enter our bodies by ingestion, inhalation, or dermal absorption. Where can we find them? For the phthalate, we can find them in the body care and all the perfumes. For the paraben, we can find them in all the cosmetics, in sunscreen, 
and in deodorant. And for the triclosan, we can find it in antibacterial agent, toothpaste, or all liquid soap. What are the hormonal effects of these chemicals? For the phthalate, they have an estrogenic and anti-androgenic effect. So they can cause a reproductive disorder in boys and delays in neuro neurodevelopment. For the parabens, they have estrogenic effect and we can find them in the breast tissue and breast tumors. For the triclosan, we can have thyroid hormone disruptor. It's a thyroid hormone disruptor. And we can even have an impact on the semen quality and IVF outcome. We don't have too much data about this, but there are some papers talking about the alteration of the semen quality with a higher use of triclosan. In this study of this keynote lecture, the name is Kamako study. They enrolled pregnant women between 1999 and 2000. The mothers were mostly Latina and below the federal poverty threshold in the States. They measured the concentration of phthalate, parabens, and phenols in the urine of the pregnant woman with two trimester and what and one at the second trimester. And after they measured the same concentrations from the children at the age of nine. The pubertal timing was assessed among 179 girls and 159 boys. And it was assessed every nine months between the age of nine and the age of 13. The best. And for the boys, testicular volume, genital development, and pubic hair development. For the results, for the girls, they observed an earlier onset of pubic hair development with the phthalate, an earlier menarche with the triclosan, an earlier breast development and pubic hair development and menarche with parabens, and a later pubic hair development with dichlorophenol. So if we look to the graphics, we see that the patient in the fourth quartile of exposure to chemicals have a significant difference in comparison with the population, normal population, in pubarchy, menarche, and telarchy. So there is a significant difference if the patient were, was, were exposed to chemicals during prenatal or peripubertal period of the childhood. For the boys' result, no relation, no real association. We have only an earlier genital development with propylaben. What was the limitation of this study? The limitation was that these chemicals are quickly metabolized. And then one or two urinary measurements may not accurately reflect usual exposure. So we cannot ev eventually have a good idea about the exposure with only two urinary measurements. So in summary, we know that several chemicals in personal care products were associated with alteration of puberty onset in girls, but not in boys. The association are both with prenatal and peripubertal exposure. For prenatal period, exposure to phthalate, we can have six months earlier pubarche and all its consequence. With prenatal exposure to clicrosone, 
we can have four months of earlier menarche and for the peripubertal period exposure to paraben could have we could have six months earlier puberty so the exposure to phthalate and triclosan in prenatal periods can alter the puberty and the menarche in girls what is the implication of this study to our normal life this study contributes to a growing literature that suggests that chemicals may impact timing of puberty in children and more than this can alter all the endocrine system so we have to raise awareness about the risk of these biochemicals and it's a good reason to be aware for all pregnant women and all teenagers girls to chemicals in personal care products thank you very much Thanks, you. Thank you, Dr. Abitaya. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Abitaya, uh, for this uh, interesting uh, talk uh, about all product where we live. Uh, normally now, uh, everybody's uh, product, and uh, really, uh, it's something uh, we should be very careful about using during pregnancy and during uh, childhood uh, period. Um, I don't know if we have any question now or we leave the question for the end. Perhaps we leave the question for the end. For the end, okay. So uh, I have pleasure to introduce my friend, uh, Professor Antoine Hanoun. He will talk about improving outcome of ovarian stimulation uh, Professor Hanoun, he is a, a leader in the field of uh, reproductive medicine at the uh, University, American University uh, of Beirut. Welcome, uh, Professor Antoine. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Shaban. Thank you for the invitation again. I'll try to share my... Uh, Is it on uh, the presentation, my presentation, or not yet? Not yet, not yet. We don't see your uh, okay, let me desktop. See. Share screen. Okay. Now it's... Okay. Yeah, yes, yes. We have it. Okay. Okay, today, I don't see any screens. Okay, I will talk about improving outcome of ovarian stimulation. Over the three days of the history Congress, there were four sessions dealing with ovarian stimulation and 22, including 22 presentations. I tried to choose the best of these that might have some clinical impact in our practice. I want just to see. I only see my uh, slides. I don't know that I can see anything else. Anyway, I will continue. What's happening?
Okay. The first topic. The first topic is about optimizing follicular development with Twitter suppression, triggering, and luteal phase support during in vitro fertilization. Adelphi consensus. What do we mean by Adelphi consensus? Is that to formulate a certain statement and then th send this statement to experts in the field, either to agree or, or disagree on that statement, and then we vote and we'll see what's the consensus. This is the Delphi consensus. I will pick the, uh, these were the experts and the uh, experts in the field and the scientific board and extended panel uh, people from different uh, countries. Now, uh, this will show the, the, the statements and I will comment on the colors or the agreement. For example, for the first statement, uh, the total agreement was 86% and the different colors uh, will tell me that the violet is absolutely agree or strongly agree. The, the brown is like, more than agree. The, uh, for example, the blue is agree. The gray is disagree and the black absolutely disagree. So I picked only those statements that pertain to uh, ovarian stimulation. And uh, the first statement would say that exogenous FSH alone is sufficient for follicular stimulation in normal patients under the age of 35. We do not need FSH and the LH. The, and this is 86% agreement. 100% agreed that there is a strong relationship or correlation between the total number of oocytes uh, obtained and the cumulative uh, live pregnancy rate. The third statement, when compared to uh, recombinant FSH treatment alone, if you add recombinant LH, we bet we get a better success rate in cases uh, of poor resp responders or low ovarian preserve. 100% agreement. The live birth rate using the long GNRH agonist protocol and the antagonist protocol are comparable, but the incidence of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome is definitely less when we use the antagonist protocol with the agonist trigger. The use of recombinant SCG and urinary SCG demonstrates same efficacy. And using still the SCG trigger is the standard gold standard in fresh cycles. Compared to SCG trigger, dual trigger or double trigger, when we use SCG and we add GNRH agonist, was shown in many studies, the, I mean the dual trigger uh, was shown to have a better pregnancy rate. But uh, more studies are needed to implement this in our daily uh, procedures. I mean to, to adapt or to adopt the, uh, the dual trigger compared to single trigger SCG. The GNRH agonist trigger and GNRH antagonist protocol is recommended for those with high risk of ovarian hyperstimulation. I mean in polycystic ovary cases, definitely now, uh, the 93% the, uh, will agree. I don't know the remainder why they didn't agree. Uh, all most will agree that the best protocol, stimulating protocol in polycystic ovary syndrome is the antagonist protocol uh, with the agonist trigger. Now I will uh, go to another topic uh, concerning what's the optimal 
GRNRH antagonist protocol. And this study is a multi-center, and it is a meta-analysis of all RCTs. The aim of the study was to identify the optimal antagonist protocol by comparing the effectiveness of GNRH antagonist protocol in terms of live birth rate and ongoing pregnancy rate. When you compare the antagonist fixed protocol with the antagonist flexible, or when you compare cetro relix with ganyo relix, or galotron with cetro T, or if you use the antagonist protocol with or without oral contrast contraceptive pretreatment. The results of this study for Comparison between fixed versus flexible protocols, the live birth, no trials reported on live birth. The ongoing pregnancy, it was lower with flexible compared to fixed protocol. When you uh, check for <coughs> subpopulation analysis, they had lower the uh, pregnancy rate, lower for flexible protocol, when ultrasound was the only criteria used for the fixed protocol. And there was no significant difference in normal responders, whether fixed or variable. Uh, no significant difference when only studies reporting on cetro relics were analyzed. The comparison between Ghana relics and cetro relics, live births, only one study that showed no difference. Ongoing pregnancy, no studies reported on ongoing pregnancy. When uh, we compare OCP, the pill pretreatment versus no treatment, here we are talking about all cases of uh, GNRH antagonist protocols. No significant difference in live birth rate was diagnosed, but on ongoing pregnancy, it was lower when we use the OCP pretreatment, and we know that. We used the pill before the antagonist protocol, trying to manipulate the start of the uh, cycle and the date of the uh, follicle aspiration. OCP pretreatment versus no pretreatment. It is lower in fixed protocol with OCP pretreatment versus no treatment. So, no treatment is better than with treatment. Lower with OCP pretreatment when ganyorelix was used but no significant difference for normal responders. If we use other than the pill for pretreatment before the cycle of the antagonist, like estradiol, like progestin, there was no difference or it was, there was no sufficient data or no difference in the outcome using different than the contraceptive pill. So in conclusion, uh, the use of the antagonist fixed protocol uh, was a lower success rate compared to the antagonist fixed protocol uh, with no OCP. The use of the antagonist flexible protocol may result in lower ongoing pregnancy rate compared to the antagonist fixed protocol. And the SUPRA score suggested the antagonist fixed no uh, pre-treatment to be the optimal GNRH antagonist protocol, both in terms of live birth and ongoing practice. So this is the best uh, GNRH antagonist protocol from the study. Another article also tackled the same uh, point, the same topic, which is showing the superiority of cumulative live birth af after GNRH after GNRH antagonist cycle. Uh, this study aimed to investigate the cumulative, and we will stress the cumulative live birth rate for various ovarian stimulation protocols. It is uh, from Japan, and they collected the data, and uh, after excluding Many, many uh, patients, they analyzed uh, more than uh, 200,000 fresh cycles and about around 180,000 
frozen cycles. And uh, an observation in Japan is that uh, the uh, mild uh, stimulation protocols were used in almost 42% of the cases. And this is be because uh, around 40% of their populations are, are elderly in the 40s. So they compared six uh, stimulation protocols, the GNRH antagonist, GNRH agonist, a clomiphene citrate with low-dose gonadotropin, letrozole let with uh, low-dose uh, gonadotropin, uh, clomiphene citrate alone, and letrozole alone. And the main outcome was the cumulative live birth rate per stimulation. Per, I mean uh, aspiration, per, per follicle retrieval. What are the results? Definitely the antagonist protocol, protocol uh, had the highest number of oocytes retrieved on the average. For the overall, overall um, cumulative live birth rate, the antagonist protocol also uh, got the highest success rate, but because they don't have data on the ovarian reserve, whether anti-molecular, uh, anti-molarian hormone or, or uh, FSH, they group their patient uh, uh, depending on the number of oocytes retrieved. So uh, for the cumulative life uh, birth rate, for high responders, those having more than 15 oocytes, the GNRH antagonist got the highest uh, success rate. And the colors represent other uh, of, uh, ovarian stimulation. Now, for normal responders, getting 10 to 15 oocytes, the clomiphene citrate plus gonadotropin had the better success rate. For the suboptimal responders, getting four to nine oocytes, the clomiphene citrate alone had the better success rate. Still talking about the cumulative live uh, birth rate. When we uh, talk, uh, get when we analyze the poor responders, one to three oocytes, letrozole alone is the best protocol to use. So the main findings were that GNRH antagonist protocol had the highest live birth rate, the cumulative. The superiority of the GNRH antagonist protocol was mainly observed in high responders. Among poor responders, the birth rate of the mild ovarian stimulation protocols yielded similar or even higher pregnancy rate or live birth rate. Now, the clinical implication of this study in our uh, daily practice, uh, shall we, many, many of us will start with the highest dose in poor responders, trying to get the highest number of, um, uh, of eggs, but uh, shall we change this practice and start from the beginning with the mild stimulation and those we expect to have poor response? I will leave it to the individual judgment for this. Now I uh, go to the third topic, which is uh, using progesterone and progestin, uh, progestogens to replace the analogs and suppressing the uh, LH and preventing the premature LS search. And uh, progesterone can be used in such a situation in only two categories of patients. Those patients that will have um, uh, freeze-all, freeze-all protocol, because definitely you cannot use progesterone, it will have its effect on the endometrial lining, and hence you cannot transfer fresh embryos in the same uh, cycle that you are using progesterone. And the other group of patients are the uh, donor cycles that Definitely, we don't need to transfer any embryos because those patients being stimulated will donate uh, their eggs. So, um, in this study, it's a retrospective study, uh, definitely in freeze all cycles, 
and the blastocyst culture, they divided the patients into three groups, the antagonistic group and the uh, pro uh, progestogen the group given in the follicular phase when you start the cycle, and the third group in the luteal phase and progesterone when you stimulate patients starting in the luteal phase. They use FSH plus or minus LH for stimulation. And uh, the antagonist cycle, we have the flexible protocol, uh, the uh, follicle, the uh, progestogen given in the follicular phase started at day two to three. And more than day 18, the, in the luteal phase, progestogen was started at day 18 or more after confirming ovulation by ultrasound. Uh, the progesterone was given from the beginning of the cycle till the day of the trigger. And they used three types of progesterone, medroxyprogesterone acetate, 10 milligrams per day, uh, didrogesterone or uh, dufastone, 20 milligrams per day, and natural micronized progesterone like utrogestan or others, 100 to 200 milligram per day, not a very high dose. What are the results? Uh, comparing these three protocols, there was no, uh, the, the age group and the antagonist, it happened to be slower, and this is why the FSH, anti-Mullerian hormone, and the anterior follicle count were uh, better in the antagonist group, but th this, uh, concerning the results, it did not really affect the results because the embryos transferred, the implantation rate, the, the biochemical pregnancy rate, uh, the clinical pregnancy rate, and all these were not different between among all these different groups. So the conclusions from this study is that the antagonistic group had better prognosis uh, concerning, uh, it, it happened that, has a better problem, but this progestin uh, cycles, either follicular or luteal, had higher fertilization rate when compared to antagonist. Progestin did not affect euploid implantation and pregnancy rate, and the luteal phase stimulation did not affect euploid implantation and pregnancy rate. So all these protocols uh, did not affect the quality of the oocytes and the quality of the embryos. Now, similarly, another uh, study presentation also tackled the, the problem, but in this study, they had the uh, compare between different progestin regimes for pituitary suppression. And uh, the comparison was between two different progestins or the same progestin with two uh, different doses. The, the primary outcome was uh, the live birth rate but secondary outcomes included all the other parameters. When they compared medroxyprogesterone acetate or Provera with didrogesterone, there was no uh, difference among uh, all the parameters from duration of stimulation, gonadotropin dosage, oocytes collected, metaphase two, the mature uh, oocytes, even clinical pregnancy rate, uh, the live birth rate, so no difference uh, when they compare these two progestins. And the dose was only 10 milligrams hydroxyprogesterone and 20 milligrams uh, dufasto. When they compared the uh, uh, dufasto, 20 milligrams with uh, micronized progesterone, let's say otrogestan with 100 milligrams, there was no difference in all parameters. When they compared medroxyprogesterone acetate with micronized uh, uh, progesterone, also there was no difference in all the parameters. Now, when they compare different dosages for the same progesterone, like 100 milligrams versus 200 milligrams of protrogestan, micronized, natural micronized, uh, uh, there was no difference except the, the duration of stimulation and total gonadotropin uh, consumption were higher when we used the higher dose. And maybe this is because we have more suppression uh, of the endogenous uh, LH. 
and the gonadotropins. When they compared also different dosages of the medroxyprogesterone acetate, MPA, 4 milligrams versus the uh, 10 milligrams, also there was no difference. So the conclusion is that progestins are capable of effectively suppressing endogenous cell surge and premature ovulation. Uh, medroxyprogesterone acetate and uh, all different pro uh, progestins seem to be similarly affected, even in the smaller dosages. The choice can rely on the cost, side effect, and safety profile, although none of the studies evaluated patient uh, satisfaction. Um, I think this, this is, uh, or let me continue about progesterone, and then we'll talk about the clinical impact. Now, uh, another two uh, studies or presentations tackled the same problem of progesterone in donor cycles. And here, comparison of um, the micronized uh, progesterone. It's a prospective randomized clinical trial. And uh, comparing the uh, uh, medroxyprogesterone as a, uh, a state, uh, Provera 10 milligram, with the antagonist protocol. And uh, the only difference here is that instead of the GNRH agonist, we, they gave uh, progesterone uh, starting the stimulation from day two till the day of uh, trigger. The results between both uh, studies, the days of stimulation, total FSH dose, follicles more than 13, oocytes retrievals, uh, and all, all these parameters there were no, there was no difference uh, among them, even the mature oocytes and mature oocyte rate. Now, the, these are donor cycles. When they used those uh, eggs and recipients, uh, also they found uh, no difference uh, between whether the eggs were uh, obtained using the progesterone uh, protocols the cycle or the antagonist cycle. The live birth rate was comparable and pregnancies uh, ongoing rate. Now, when they uh, uh, assess the satisfaction of the patients, uh, definitely uh, the, uh, the donors were more satisfied when using the oral progesterone instead of the injection, the GNRH yeah. injection. Bye. Bye. When, uh, when they uh, ask the patient the donors who used before a donor cycle with the antagonist and then they used another donor cycle with the uh, progesterone, definitely their satisfaction with the oral progesterone was higher. So uh, progesterone it, it provides uh, the similar number of oocytes and uh, mature oocytes, endocrine profile, number of viable embryos and live birth rate. Uh, so uh, the clinical implication, uh, another study also for uh, progesterone uh, in donor uh, donation cycles, and this is um, the protocol between the antagonist cycle and the natural micronized progesterone. Also, the results uh, showed that uh, everything was uh, comparable from basal characteristics to oocytes uh, collected the total number of eggs, total number of mature eggs, uh, and the recipients also, uh, the fertilization rate, the embryonic arrest rate, and uh, the number of embryos transferred, the ongoing pregnancy rate, and the multiple pregnancy rate, all were the same. And uh, what in this article the authors recommend, this is from uh, Spain, is that using uh, progesterone to suppress premature LH surge or to suppress LH uh, during the stimulation cycles of donors, uh, they recommend that to use progesterone. It is efficient, uh, it is adequate, and it's more friendly. And they advise that uh, this should be the gold standard in the uh, stimulation of uh, donors. And I think in, in, in those cases or uh, uh, who is using the donor cycles, uh, I think this should be recommended uh, to replace uh, either the agonist or the GNRH antagonist uh, protocols. 
Now the fourth topic, uh, uh, it's entitled a drop in serum progesterone from day three to day five of a fresh blastocyst transfer when using SCG trigger and the standard luteal support. Now the, we know that uh, the source of progesterone in the luteal phase comes from uh, two, two places. The endogenous production under the action of SCG that used uh, at the trigger, as a trigger, and the luteal support or exogenous progesterone administration. And one would think that maybe the level of progesterone is the same since we are using the luteal support. It's the same in all patients undergoing stimulation and embryo transfer in fresh cycle. So the objective of this study was to investigate whether we have really difference in the progesterone level after uh, egg retrieval. So the inclusion criteria, females below 40, uh, BMI less than 35, patients getting more than three uh, mature eggs or sites, irrespective of the ovarian reserve, and the cycle stimulated with uh, GnRH agonist and uh, uh, or antagonist protocol. They included both, whether agonist or antagonist protocol. Uh, ovarian stimulation, as I said, with the long uh, GRH agonist or the antagonist, uh, stimulation with the recombinant FSH, and the trigger with SCG or Ovitrel, recombinant SCG. The luteal support, they use the same luteal support for all patients, which, which is the uh, uh, vaginal progesterone gel, crinone, 8%, uh, only one suppository, one suppository started on the next day of the ovum pickup in the morning. And uh, they continued uh, this uh, luteal support till after the pregnancy, till the gestational sac was detected. <clears throat> now, uh, they measured progesterone uh, five times during the cycle. On the day of the trigger, uh, on the day of ovum pickup, uh, day three after pickup, day five and day 14, the day of pregnancy test, and during the day between 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. The results, um, I will mention only the conclusions because of the lack of uh, the results, lack of uh, time. When they did the logistic uh, regression analysis, they identified they to identify the independent predictors of uh, uh, ongoing pregnancy, they found that the change in progesterone level, whether a drop or increase, was uh, diagnosed as an independent predictor of pregnancy rate. And they found that if we have decrease in progesterone level between day three and day five, this will affect the pregnancy rate and the patient will have a lower pregnancy rate. They tried also to uh, determine using logistic regression analysis to identify the independent predictors of the negative delta progesterone. What would really affect, what parameters would lead to decrease in the progesterone level between day three and uh, day five? And they could diagnose uh, two, um, uh, two predictors, the body mass, obesity, and the second one is the total dose of FSH use. And maybe these are two linked together because in obese patients, we might need a higher dose for stimulation uh, or in, uh, in poor responders also, we might uh, need a higher dose uh, for, for stimulation. And these will affect the progesterone level in the luteal uh, phase. So in conclusion for this study, uh, they detected that uh, uh, not as we expected, the level of progesterone will, uh, is not the same in all patients, although we are giving luteal support. There was a significant interpersonal variation in the circulating progesterone level. And one third of the patients have a drop in progesterone 
from day three to day five. And this resulted in 2.5 fold decrease in ongoing pregnancy rates. Now, the uh, delta progesterone, the, the, the change, is an independent predictor of on, ongoing pregnancy. Uh, and the BMI and total dose of SHS are independent predictors of negative delta P. So, as we saw that one size will fit all is not valid. And because we have this change, one may think of it is uh, for clinical implication. Do we need to uh, measure progesterone between day three and day five? So that if we find that this level is decreasing, we have to supplement, or maybe we have to freeze all at day five and uh, transfer uh, in another cycle. So this might have some clinical implication on how we practice uh, in our daily life uh, practice. Now the last topic I will talk about, also I saw that it's a new topic, is that the evaluation of time interval between ovulation trigger with, uh, the, uh, with the agonist trigger, tryptorelin acetate, and oocyte retrieval in IPF cycles, the randomized control study. It's an interesting study. They want to determine what's the best interval. We know that after, uh, for uh, many studies, we know that the best timing to um, uh, retrieve, to aspirate follicles is around 36 hours after triggering with, the, uh, with SCG. But uh, no studies were uh, done to check the proper timing uh, to trigger after the uh, triggering with the agonist, agonist uh, trigger. And uh, uh, to, to know this, they want uh, the, the outcome, primary outcome, is the number of uh, oocytes, the total number of oocytes retrieved, and the total number of mature oocytes retrieved, and we have secondary outcome, including the pregnancy rate, cumulative pregnancy rate, etc. So this is an, um, an antagonist protocol, a regular protocol, and they trigger with the agonist, and they divided the patients into four groups. Uh, aspirating follicles uh, uh, after 24 hours from the time of the trigger, and this they know that it will have a poor response, but they included it just uh, for, as a proof of concept. And then after 30 hours, 36 hours, the reference uh, work, and 40 hours. What are the results? The group after 24 hours, we realized that they have a total number of follicles at the trigger day, 18.5. We got only uh, a total number of eggs, only 7.25, and the mature eggs were only 0 0.25. We know that this is, uh, this is not uh, timing, not a good timing. Now, when they compared between 30 hours, 36 hours, and 40 hours, uh, they were comparable in, in, in parameters, except, except in four parameters, that uh, the LH level, uh, the LH uh, day of oocyte uh, retrieval, or the, the LH level at the day of oocyte retrieval, because it was near at 30 compared to 36 and 40, definitely it would be higher. This is expected. But the, the number of mature oocytes retrieved were higher at 36 hours compared to 30 hours and compared to 40 hours. Also, the, what's, uh, what differs is the uh, mature oocytes uh, per oocytes rate, also it was higher at 36, and the number of embryos uh, we get was higher uh, when we aspirate at 36 hours. So uh, this study confirmed that what we are practicing, uh, aspirating follicles after uh, agonist trigger at 36 hours is correct, uh, and gives higher number of mature oocytes, higher numbers of embryos compared to 30 or, th or 40, 34 or th uh, 40 hours uh, period. The live birth rates were not different between groups, although the study was not designed to detect difference in live birth. Thank you for your attention. 
Okay, thank you very much. It was very, very, very interesting, uh, Dr. Hanun. Uh, we have maybe one question here. Uh, suppression of pituitary with progesterone, does it affect serum progesterone level on day of triggering and implantation rate also? This question is for me. Huh? Sorry, can yes. you, could you repeat uh, the question? Hey. Suppression of pituitary with progesterone, does it affect serum progesterone level on day of triggering and also uh, uh, implantation rate? Yes, definitely. Theoretically, this was not really assessed because, you know, uh, if the question is implied that if we have a high progesterone level at the day of, the, of, uh, of triggering, would it really affect the outcome? Uh, Studies showed that progesterone will not affect the quality and competency of the follicles, oocytes, that are retrieved. But uh, the one who is asking should realize that when we use progesterone, we are not transferring fresh cycles. We are not, we cannot. It's only, yeah, sure. it's only used when we want to freeze all and when we want to uh, in donor cycles. So this is not really, to me, it's not relevant whether the progesterone level is high or low. But definitely, so, I mean, logically, it should be high. But it's uh, really a very interesting uh, method uh, to use, yes. especially yes. for don donor patient. And uh, Yes. Uh, I, I have one patient uh, two weeks ago. Uh, uh, stimulation was done with... Uh, uh, antagonist cycle and triggering by uh, GNRH uh, analog mm? mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we add one uh, hundred uh, one thousand five hundred uh, HCG okay as I mentioned uh, yes. uh, and uh, yeah. she she's a PCO patient and she developed a, a, a severe hyperstimulation syndrome really Yes, she, she's pregnant, but she developed hyperstimulation syndrome, and we did some uh, situs uh, puncture uh, to help her, but she, she's still pregnant. What's your question, uh, Mustafa? No, to use uh, no, or not to use? Yeah, yeah, to use or not to use if this you want my, of... Uh, if you want my experience in these cases, the agonist trigger, uh, personally, I don't agree to use any SCG, because if you want to... Think logically about this. We are using SCG to stimulate the production of progesterone and estrogen. So why not to supplement, to increase the dose of estrogen and progesterone in these cycles? And I think they will do the purpose. Because when you think about donor or frozen cycles, in the luteal phase, you only support exogenously with estrogen and progesterone. And you have a very good luteal support and a very good because the, you know that the pregnancy rate for frozen cycles are nowadays mm -hmm. even better than fresh cycles. Absolutely. So to me, this is a personal opinion, to me, from my experience, I, I never use FCG again because definitely it will increase the hyperstimulation, especially if a pregnancy occurs because pregnancy yeah. also per se, per se will increase the hyperstimulation. Certainly, certainly. So use FCG or Okay, uh, I don't know if we have another other question. Uh, uh, okay, uh, Doctor Doctor Lara Haider, she uh, raised her hand. Doctor Lara, Doctor uh, Sandus Ali also, also, but uh, we don't have the their question. Anyway, maybe uh, at the end we can ask you some other we question. Can ask question. And we will answer at the end. Yes, we thank you very much. Uh, yes, we'll ask them to write questions and maybe you will have a, a question and answer, and answer session at the end. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Dr. Antoine. Okay, mm -hmm. we move for uh, next uh, topic. Uh, Long-term impact on obstetrical outcome relating to infertility treatment, presented by uh, Dr. Fadi Mirza. Uh, he is uh, associate uh, professor uh, at American University of Beirut, 
uh, in obstetric and uh, gynecology and he is a specialist in uh, uh, fetal maternal medicine. Welcome, Fadi. Okay. 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 So Hello. thank you so much, Mustafa, for the kind uh, introduction. I'd like to thank the uh, Lebanese Fertility Society for their uh, kind invitation. It's been a while since, uh, you know, since we engaged <coughs> in such events. And actually, issue, issue this year was, was quite interesting. I have, to, I have to admit, I actually went in and listened to some of those videos. <coughs> now, when it comes to <coughs> excuse me, IVF outcomes, I really didn't find a lot of, uh, <coughs> a lot of uh, updates when it comes to that, that particular uh, project. Or, or topic. So we, ha we have a few, few new updates, but what I decided to do, you know, in uh, coordination with, with George is kind of build a review on the overall outcome of IVF pregnancies, you know, be it short term, long term, uh, etc., as it pertains to, uh, you know, us as obstetricians and uh, gynecologists. So basically, the question that we're, we're trying to, uh, to answer is, this is a very famous picture. I think we're all familiar with, or uh, you know, every person who engages in, engages in IVF knows that this is Louise uh, Brown, who has been labeled as you know a super babe when she was born. And the question today in our presentation is: Are those babies actually super babes, or to the contrary, the opposite? And one point that I'd like uh, to emphasize is that in our minds, we, we've always been uh, accustomed to the idea that IVF, their multiples, their twins, their triplets, their quadruplets, their octuplets. But when you dig into the, uh, the literature, this is you know data from the US um, uh, that have shown that actually nearly half of those babies or the half of um, IVF babies are actually singletons. And when you actually look at the number of, baby, uh, of, of pregnancies rather than babies, you discover that 70% of those pregnancies are actually singletons. So you tell me, okay, so, so who cares? Well, I do care because I was asked to uh, dissect the outcome of those IVF pregnancies. And when I look into you know, those outcomes, I realize that multiple pregnancies when it comes to their to their you know short term and long term outcomes they're actually quite comparable to to spontaneous pregnancies so to me as somebody caring for for multiples whether they're ivf product or or spontaneous most of the data again i say most of the data suggests that their outcomes are relatively the same this does not apply to singletons where we know now be it short term or long term outcomes the outcome of singleton pregnancies are, uh, after IVF can be different or are different from, from spont their spontaneous counterparts. So when I realized that, you know, 70% or maybe more now with, with, the, with the paradigm shift towards uh, single embryo transfers, when I realized that most of my IVF pregnancies today in 2020 are singletons, and I realized that their outcome is, uh, is different, it is an important point to so starting with the short-term outcomes, well, preterm birth was one of the first things that was, was looked at in, uh, in the past. And among the, the earliest studies were those two studies from the U.S. One was, uh, one, the most recent one was published in uh, Fertility Sterility. They were large meta-analyses that compared the outcome of IVF singletons and spontaneously conceived single, singletons. They were matched. It was an excellent uh, study design. And look at the number. There was a nearly two-fold increase, <coughs> excuse me, in, 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 uh, in preterm birth in the uh, IVF pregnancies compared to their spontaneous counterparts. So it was actually an alarming number derived from a large number of studies. As you see, this was a meta-analysis of 15 studies. The, as you see here, nearly a two-fold increase. 
The other study, which uh, was uh, published in Fertility Stability, again, the largest study that looked at this, included now 27 articles and again reproduced relatively similar data showing a nearly two-fold increase in, in preterm birth in those IVF singleton pregnancies as you see here. Now, the big question is why? Why are those uh, babies or why are those pregnancies at risk for, uh, for uh, preterm birth? Well, this was looked at by, by Pimborg et al. in this landmark uh, article, which you know, I, uh, I uh, uh, suggest that you know, everyone try to pull this. It's actually one of the landmarks. It was published in Human Reproduction Update, which as you know, is, is a leading uh, journal in our field that tried to look at specifically the, the, the reason for, for this outcome. They included a large number of studies. As you see here, they narrowed it down to nearly 65 studies of excellent study design. They really wanted to look at preterm birth and what leads to, uh, to preterm birth. Well, they noted that most of the studies suggest a rate, an increase in rate of preterm birth that ranges from about 1.4 to two in, um, uh, in, in when it comes to preterm birth and nearly a two to three fold increase in very preterm birth. So it was actually an alarming study. Now the good news, when they looked at the studies as a function of time, they noted that the most recent studies actually reported only a modest increase rather than having a two fold increase it was more of 1.15 or 1.2. So I think we are doing better, uh, or IVF specialists are, are doing better when it comes to, to the outcome of those uh, pregnancies. Now to try to dig <coughs> into the reason or the, the pathophysiology here, they did a few elegant um, uh, analyses. First, they looked at women who were subfertile. They did not undergo IVF or any ART intervention. And they just looked at you know, time to pregnancy, TTP. So they saw that subfertile women, the TTP of more than one year, compared to those that were able to get pregnant before one year, there was a 35% increase in the rate of preterm birth in those quote unquote subfertile women. Why is that? Well, I think it makes total sense. Those women tend to, to have an inherent risk for um, for adverse pregnancy outcomes. So we're talking here about the patients themselves, their patient characteristics, not including any ART or, or interventions of, of any kind. So here, we wanna take a blame on the po population itself, especially that, you know, after the authors adjusted for duration of infertility, the perinatal outcome of those singletons were actually similar. Then they looked at, you know, <clears throat> Of, of um, uh, ovarian stimulation or, um, or, or just IUI, no IVF yet. They, they saw that the, the increase in, um, and there is increased slightly to 1.45. So you see here we have the, the patient characteristics causing an inherent risk. We're adding to it, you know, the stimulation. We're starting to go more into the iatrogenic reasons. And then when you go into IVF or ICSI, that the risk is even higher at 1.55. So technically, you are adding a layer after layer after layer of, of risk factors, starting with the core being the patient characteristics herself. Those patients are of advanced maternal age. Those patients are, have you know, thyroid disease. They may have diabetes, et cetera, et cetera. We're adding to it the effect of the uh, stimulation itself and then we're adding to it IVF. So this increases as those layers increase. Now, a nice, a nice, uh, a nice uh, way of trying to, you know, dissecting the blame. What should we blame more? The patient, the intervention, et cetera. They did actually a, a analysis of studies of the same, the same patients who had, you know, IVF or had spontaneous and you could see that the risk is somewhere in the middle, 1.27. So basically what this study is telling us is that you know, we, can, we can split the blame or we can split the impact uh, the adver of adverse pregnancy outcome, 50% on the patient herself and 50% on our intervention. Well, you might ask me, well, what do we think about you know, 
the fresh uh, versus the, the frozen? Well, as you might expect, the fresh tend, the, uh, the frozen tend to do better when it comes to preterm birth or adverse pregnancy outcomes in general. Why? I think if we follow the same thought process, we're having less stimulation here. So we are removing one layer that leads to this adverse pregnancy outcome here. So a nearly 20% reduction in the risk when we go for frozen compared to, uh, to fresh. How about, uh, how about the, uh, the risk of, uh, no, I think this is pretty much the same. How about low birth weight? You know, we cannot think of a preterm birth if we don't look into uh, low birth weight. Well, the same pathophysiology stands here as well. We do know now that there is a strong association between low birth weight and, uh, and IVF when it comes to, to singleton pregnancies, the group that we are looking at. This was a large, large study uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine that looked at nearly a population of over 40,000 infants. And again, it was noted that low birth weight was significantly more common among term singletons conceived by ART compared to the general population. You see a nearly two to three fold increase as you see here. And this trend applies to both term as well as preterm low birth weight. More recent data out of the US, they published in the Green Journal. Now we're seeing, you know, going into the 2000s, obviously now we're in the more advanced days of, um, of ART. We see that the risk is slightly lower compared to the, uh, to the initial studies, but we're still talking about a risk of low birth weight of nearly 1.6. So we're talking about a 60% increase in risk of, uh, of low birth weight. So again, I think the same thought process uh, applies here that the one that we looked at with preterm birth. The Pimborg uh, large meta-analysis also looked at this, again reported a relatively similar low birth weight. Placenta previa is something that we again uh, have examined or uh, again has been looked at in uh, patients with, uh, with IVF uh, pregnancies, we know again there is an increased risk of placenta previa in the setting of IVF singleton pregnancies. And that risk, according to you know, a large uh, Norwegian study, was in the range of six fold increase, as, as you see here. That the, um, the risk was about 5.6, so it's a pretty high number. Well, again, let's try to do the same, the same kind of. Uh, game, let's see what can we blame uh, the patient form and what can we blame the, the procedure for. Well, this was a very interesting study published in 2006 that looked at the risk of placenta previa in the exact same mothers who conceived spontaneously compared to conceiving by IVF. So here we are removing you know, the, the patient characteristics out of the picture and looking at the you know, impact of intervention we see here that the risk was threefold higher in IVF pregnancy. So again, the same thought process or the same rationale, patient characteristics contribute, ART intervention contributes pretty much equally. We cannot talk about previa without talking about cesarean uh, delivery. S extremely or exceedingly high cesarean delivery rates have been uh, reported by uh, by, uh, by studies examining the outcome of IVF pregnancies, even in singletons, and numbers as high as 80% have been, have been reported. And I think when we look around us in, in our centers, we realize that this population does have an increased risk of cesarean deliveries for, for different reasons, which we're going to talk about. I'm sure one risk factor for this increase in cesarean delivery rates is malpresentation. Another one is placenta previa, which uh, we had just demonstrated that it does increase in the setting of IVF uh, pregnancies. So cesarean rates have been looked at in, in, in a number of uh, meta-analyses. This was one of them. You see rates of 44% compared to 27.8% in, uh, in, in, in women with IVF single-term pregnancies compared to their spontaneous uh, counterparts. And this 
does uh, the same trend applies to both term as you see on your left and preterm as you see on the right. So we have to acknowledge, you know, that IVF specialists will have a higher rate of, of cesarean uh, deliveries because of a number of risk factors that we will discuss. Preeclampsia was something that very recently uh, was, uh, has, you know, become of, of interest. Um, especially in the frozen, uh, frozen embryos uh, or froze, frozen uh, cycles. This was looked at in the most recent uh, ishri. There was actually an abstract by Rollins out of Brussels that did, that did demonstrate an increase in the risk of preeclampsia in uh, frozen embryo transfer cycles. A big question that I get asked as a perinatologist, and I'm sure uh, almost every IVF specialist gets asked because it's something, you know, of interest to, to tabloids and to, to uh, magazines, etc., which is, you know, the risk of congenital anomalies. And does IVF predispose those pregnancies to congenital anomalies? And as you see, it's, it's really of, of interest to, to, to magazines and tabloids, etc. Well, the whole thought process of the association between congenital anomalies and ART became popular with the introduction of ICSI for a number of reasons. First, it's postulated that the use of sperm with you know, certain abnormalities, uh, overcoming you know, the natural selection process, uh, could predispose uh, this embryo to anomalies. The mechanical and or biochemical damage to the oocyte, uh, introduction of foreign material into the oocyte, etc. Those were all theoretical risks that you know, brought to light the, uh, let's say, the, the whole association between congenital anomalies and ICSI. Uh, the first data, first set of data came out of, uh, of Brussels where ICSI was, was developed uh, many years ago. And the initial report was, um, uh, had a rate of about 3.3% for major birth defects, which was quote unquote, uh, labeled as within the expected range. Then the, the data was dissected um, in, a, in a subsequent study that actually showed that, you know what, it's not within the normal range. And there is indeed a twofold increase in major birth defects with ICSI compared to, uh, compared to non-IVF or non-ICSI uh, pregnancies. Most recently, a large meta-analysis of 46 studies, more than 100,000 infants, looked at this specific question and did see or did report a modest increase of about 1.3 relative risk in the risk of, of birth defects. But what you see here is you see, you know, numbers all, all over the place, different systems being affected. Number one is the central nervous system. Now, the problem with this data is if you look at, it, at another set of data, you see a completely different trend when it comes to those, uh, to those symptoms, such as this one was, was published out of, out of uh, US in JAMA, April 2016. And so actually, yes, again, a modest increase of about 1.3, but the, the, the trend was completely, completely different. So the question here, how do we counsel those patients? Well, we have to, acknowledge that there is a slight increase in, in birth defects, a modest increase, but when it comes to specifics, there has been really no specific correlation, let's say like diabetes. We know when it comes to diabetes or pregnancy, what are the, the classic. We know with lithium, what's the exposure, what's the, the, uh, the classic. When it comes to, to IVF, there has been really no robust association between specific uh, abnormalities and IVF. Last but not least, chromosomal abnormalities. Again, this has been something that has been uh, looked at. Very, very limited, uh, limited initial reports that looked at very small, uh, very small number, 18 cases, 16 cases, etc. Most of the data that came came actually uh, more in the in the early 2000s um, in a study published in 2005 in the Green Journal and another one published in 2011 out of fertility sterility. These were, were large uh, studies. Most of them were actually secondary analyses, and they did show no association whatsoever between chromosomal abnormalities 
and ART, and both studies uh, showed pretty much the same the same uh, results. Now, I think this is pretty much it when it comes to to short ter short term uh, adverse pregnancy outcomes. But let's jump into the more the long term, uh, and we're not going to have a lot of data as you're going to see, but. I think it's becoming more and more interesting to, to investigators. So this is Louise Brown. We saw her picture as, as a baby. We're seeing her now as a toddler. She became an adult, and ultimately, she became a mother herself. So what, what kind of risks was Louise at, at risk for throughout her uh, you know, uh, childhood and later adult? Because we know, based on you know, a lot of theories, including the, you know, the Barker, theory that our, uh, our pregnancy is a window into our adult life. And indeed, if you look into the literature, you're going to find a lot of studies. Uh, I wouldn't call them studies, but they're more of small series here and there that have linked IVF to cancer, to autism, to anxiety, depression, asthma, etc. And I would caution everyone that when you, when you want to label uh, you know, an association or when you want to coin an association, be careful, dig into the data because you're going to find, and this is what I found when I reviewed the, uh, uh, you know, this topic for the first time, that studies are extremely, extremely limited with very small numbers. So you can find something on the association between autism and pretty much everything in life. So you're going to find something that links autism to, to ART. But what kind of data is that and how convincing this is the question. I think there has been a number of studies on, you know, neurodevelopmental issues, um, be it, you know, psychomotor, cognitive, behavioral, socio-emotional uh, socio development, mental retardation, etc. And most of the new data, including, you know, a, a very, a very important uh, fertility sterility publication 2013 found no association between any of those neural developmental issues. Uh, when it comes to you know, data on cognitive and behavioral development, they're very limited. Uh, psychomotor development, there was uh, no deficit in the, in the study. Uh, to me, when I look at, at, at the literature, I'm not, I'm not convinced and I'm not uh, worried. Cancer, on the other, uh, on the other hand, again, is, has been something that uh, became of interest, especially in in, uh, in recent years. And here you will find you will find uh, some studies that have shown a slight increase in the risk of cancer in offspring. That has been, you know, attributed to either problem a, a genetic problem, um, you know, at the level at the level of of the embryo or or to uh, uh, the stimulation, stimulation uh, effect, although, again, these are all theoretical in nature. What were most of the cancers that have been, uh, you know, associated with IVF? You're going to find hematological cancers. You're going to find CNS uh, cancers and other solid cancers. These were the ones that stood out in this large meta-analysis that I, uh, I mentioned. Now, when it comes to, you know, when it comes to this data, like I say here, these associations do not establish causality. So you, you cannot find a clear, uh, a clear pathophysiologic explanation for the increase in these specific cancers. But when it comes to our, our patients, we do have to acknowledge when we're asked that there has been an association. Is it convincing? Perhaps not, but it's, it's there. Now, before I end, the big question is, okay, you, you, you are able to demonstrate that there is a difference in, in the adverse pregnancy outcomes, in the long-term outcomes of those IVF uh, pregnancies. But what's the you know, explanation? Well, I think one of the themes uh, that you know, I used throughout the presentation was you know, kind of the, the dual, the dual uh, etiology the patient characteristics herself. Again, our IVF patients are older. They, they can have comorbidities, uh, et cetera, which predispose them to um, adverse pregnancy outcomes to, and long-term outcome uh, abnormalities when it comes to their, to their babies. 
or to their infants later on, as well as some iatrogenic risks that are related to, to our intervention. Again, another, another thing we have to, that has been uh, blamed where, you know, fertility drugs, the effect of the stimulation itself, the alteration in the endocrine uh, profile that results from, from our stimulation. Does the, the lab procedures play a role? Possible. But one thing that, you know, I want to end with before the thank you is we have to acknowledge that, you know, this is a vulnerable population. Uh, this is the most precious quote unquote, I know every pregnancy is, is precious, uh, but I think a lot of IVF pregnancies tend to be, you know, super precious. And when I say that, I'm gonna take just a very simple example, which is, you know, the increase in cesarean delivery rates. Well, we saw numbers that were as high as 80%. Yes, there is an effect for the advanced maternal age. Yes, there's gonna be an effect for the increase in placenta previa. But we have to remember one other factor which we cannot, you know, uh, we cannot overlook, which is the, the preciousness or, or how precious this pregnancy is. When that patient who's, you know, 45 comes to you, tells you, doctor, I've had seven IVF cycles. This is my eighth. It finally worked. I'm so scared. I want to have a cesarean delivery. Well, she's probably going to get a cesarean delivery. Uh, so, so what I'm trying to say is that, yes, there's an effect for the patient characteristics. Yes, there's an effect for our interventions, but there is an effect for, for, uh, for the patient, um, you know, wish or patient desire and how, you know, how we manage those cases, those cases, the caution that we, we pursue when we manage those cases. And with this, Mustafa, I'm going to end my talk and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Fadi and comprehensive uh, talk. Uh, the time to pregnancy is interesting of uh, this. Uh, uh, is it the uh, female or It's this infertility camp from factor or female. You don't understand. Uh, you hear? Mustafa, you, 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 you really interrupted. Ah, I interrupted. Okay. Yeah, I, I repeat. I repeat. There's a question about placenta previa and link to IVF. Written. Do you like to answer it? In that is, I asking you uh, in which way IVF includes placenta previa. What does that mean? Well, I think we cannot, we cannot really link IVF to placenta previa. So you mean the, the what's the pathophysiology here? And what yes. how does it contribute? I don't think we can answer this. Like Tony said, it's it's very hard to, to link it. It definitely exists. The the association exists. There's no causal causal relationship. Uh, I'm just gonna call it an association. Um, this is where you know the effect of the uh, the implant, you know, at the end of the day, you guys know more than I do. When it comes to IVF pregnancies. The, the, the way that you know uh, implantation occurs, it's it's not natural. It's different than than the way that uh, you know natural uh, cycle exists. That's one. Number two, the effect of the the intervention itself, the effect of you know the the instruments itself, those have been theorized at least in in the papers. But can we find a causal relationship? The answer is no. Okay, we have a second question uh, for Dr. Hanun. Uh, the question from Dr. Nahla Majid. The pretreatment with progestin to reduce asynchrony, is it better than the use of OCP? 
No, the studies I reviewed or the studies showed no difference if you use progesterone or oral contraception. There is no difference in the outcome. Perfect. Okay, we have also a second question from Dr. Salama Abbas. Is morphological assessment of embryos enough to avoid miscarriage or fetal demise in IVF pregnancy? Um, we will talk about this in our third webinar, how to evaluate embryos and what are, what are the criteria and what are the new techniques to evaluate the embryos. But I don't think so. Just with morphological assessment, we can uh, avoid any miscarriage or fetal demise. It's two different things, and many factors interfere with miscarriage or demise, and uh, morphological assessment is one or of uh, many factors that affect this uh, pathology. If any one of the attendees wants to, uh, to raise a hand to talk directly, you can just raise your hand. We can unmute you and uh, you can ask a question. Hello? Hello? Yes, Dr. Mustafa, we are hearing you. Okay, I look. So we have no more questions. Hello? Dr. Shaban has a question, no? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, no, no, about time to pregnancy, because I lose my internet, sorry. Uh, time to pregnancy to Dr. Fadi. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it is different, uh, it's related to male fertility or female infertility. Is the same with the patient? Uh, she will have more problem with pregnancy I mean, after one year. To, to, to the opposite, actually, when they, all of those patients had, had, female, had female factors. And in fact, ah. when, when you, when you uh, compare ICSI uh, pregnancy outcomes to I, IVF pregnancy outcomes for, uh, for female factor, you see that the outcome of ICSI is much, much better than, uh, than the you know, non-ICSI. Because here, the, the females tend to be young and healthy, uh, you know, no risk factors whatsoever for those adverse pregnancy outcomes. So, uh, yeah, it is it is different outcome when it comes to male versus female factor. I see there are other questions by Sahar Hisham and Nahla Majid. Is it mandatory to remove an endometrioma before IVF? And the answer is definitely not. It's not mandatory. On the contrary, it's not recommended. And she's asking, and if the patient refuses, what's the chance of IVF cycle success? As I said, we do not recommend removing endometriomas. The second question is <clears throat> by Nahla Majid. Flexible or fixed antagonist protocol you prefer? Uh, according to all studies now and recommendations, the fixed protocol uh, gives better success rate. So definitely, I prefer the fixed protocol. Uh, practically speaking, practically speaking, the only reason we use the flexible protocol is, to me at least, is for economic reasons because <clears throat> when we use flexible protocol, we might decrease the number of days we are using the antagonist. And as uh, those in the field, tetrotid is very expensive daily injection compared to other medications. But medically speaking, definitely it's better, more successful to use the fixed protocol. We still have an, a question from Dr. Naba. Uh, yes. Thank you for the excellent presentation. A recent French study published in human reproduction showed an increased risk of maternal morbidity in women with twin gestation resulting from oocyte donation. So who wish to comment on this study? I'll, I'll comment on this. So correct. Uh, this, is, this is true. Now we have, to, we have to keep in mind that this is a very uh, select uh, population. And if you reach oocyte donation, 
most of those patients are going to be, you know, of the advanced uh, uh, maternal uh, age. We're talking, you know, 40s, high 40s and, and low 50s. And I remember when I was still practicing in, in New York, we had, we had a patient who was, who was 50, uh, who had just underwent IVF, and she actually had uh, an MI during her first, uh, her first trimester, and she ended up, she ended up uh, dying. So, so when we reach oocyte donation, I think we're talking about a very, 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 very selective uh, group. And I, I'm not sure about most centers, but I can tell you what I used to practice based on this sentinel event, the, the center decided that, you know, anyone, anyone over age 50 who would like to, to pursue, who would like to pursue uh, IVF oocyte donation, it is mandatory that they have a, an echocardiogram you know, just, just given the increase in their maternal morbidity and even mortality. So a number of centers actually mandate a full, a full uh, maternal evaluation, including echocardiograms, at least in the center where I used to practice, in those patients who are, uh, you know, of advanced maternal age, talking more than 45 or even 50, and pursuing oocyte donation. So it, the data makes total sense that uh, Dr. Naba has shared. Thank you, Dr. Okay. Mirza. We still have uh, a last question from Dr. Nahla Majid. Why poor responder respond to low dose GT? Why they respond to low dose? Yes. Gonadotrophin. Okay. Um, it's not, I mean, it's, uh, it's obvious. It's not the point that they respond or they don't respond to low dose or high dose, because when you have, when the patient has a low return, uh, irrespective of the high dose, the, the capacity or the reserve, she will respond to that. Um, we, um, it's an observation that uh, those patients with poor response will maybe respond better to their natural hormones when they, we use their own natural FSH, compared to, to high dose. And when we use the, uh, the traditional, the high hyperstimulation with the large dose, maybe it will have, when we use also the, um, the suppression of the LH with the agonist or antagonist, we might have complete suppression and this is why they will respond less. I don't know whether I could answer, but in poor responder, if we use the traditional protocol that is suppressing the uh, LH and uh, FSH by antagonist or agonist, those patients will not respond adequately, adequately compared to their respond, response to their nature or their endogenous hormones. These are the observations. It's not maybe I'm trying to explain it, give the, the mechanism for it, but it is definitely from studies. I don't know whether I could answer the, the, uh, the physician who asked. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Rasha Murishi uh, asked uh, this question. Do you recommend adding growth hormone for poor responder protocols? Now, this is a different topic, and you can talk one hour about poor responders and ways to improve their response. And the growth hormone is not one of the, I mean, no matter what you do for poor responders, poor responders will remain as poor responders. Thank you. Do I agree, George? Yes, yes, I agree. It's very difficult. There are many, many medicine, many studies. We try all the time to adjust the protocols to Im improve the response of poor responders, but they stay poor responders. And it's different from a patient to another. And we can use something for a patient and something else for, for another to have a good uh, response, but it's very difficult. But I agree that low doses is better than very high doses for poor responders. Any other questions? Uh, or maybe for low responder, uh, 
sometimes we use a spontaneous cycle and we, it's uh, very good without any, any cost. Uh, have a better uh, uh, outcome uh, uh, with uh, the all site retrieval. You what mean you natural Dr. Hanon. You mean yeah. natural? Natural site. Natural. Yes, yes. You see, as, the review, as I presented, which were the, the study, the retrospective analysis from Japan, they found that in poor responders, uh, letrozole or uh, clomiphene citrate, uh, citrate alone, <coughs> or clomid, gave better success rate. So from that study and the review, maybe for me, I might change my practice. In what way that if I have a poor responder, I always start with the maximum dose, aiming at retrieving the maximum uh, number of all sites. Maybe I might, I haven't decided yet, but I might to start with the uh, mild stimulation from the beginning in such cases. Because what we do when they don't respond with the maximum dose and the standard uh, protocols, the next cycle, what I do is to shift to minimal, to shift to minimal stimulation. And uh, we had, I had pregnancies using only chromatin citrate with some uh, gonadotropin uh, successes when the um, uh, maximum dose and the regular stimulation cycles did not even, uh, uh, the patient did not produce any folic, but they could respond to their natural uh, cycle. So maybe I might change my practice. Yes, uh, I, I agree. I agree, uh, really. And it's uh, also for psychology of patient. She accept more uh, this type uh, of practice than uh, we did uh, stimulate her by a uh, large amount of uh, gonadotropin. And it's less expensive. Yes, sure, absolutely. <laughs> very good. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Fadi, Dr. Haddad, Dr. Abitaya. Hanun, uh, uh, sorry. And uh, thanks for Mark. Uh, thanks, Elizabeth. And see you for next uh, webinar. Next uh, Tuesday, inshallah. Next, next Wednesday. Next Wednesday. Next Wednesday. Next Wednesday, Wednesday, Wednesday. At 6 o'clock also for uh, next webinar on Ishri highlights also. Yeah, we'll have also amazing topics. I think uh, uh, like the, yeah, this evening you will be... Uh, uh, numerous people to be with us for the next webinar. And thank you, and Mark, thank you. because they are with us all the time. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, everyone. And kindly, if you can fill uh, the meeting evaluation form, thank you so much for your feedback. Have a nice evening. Have a nice Hello, evening. Goodbye. 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 Goodbye.